Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Coffee Conversations with Greg J is on, well, Thursday. What date is it? Is it today the 11th, the 12th? Whew, I'm losing track, man. I'm still safer at home. <laughs> Of Zoom meetings, man, can't go anywhere, can't get to the restaurants, although they're lightening that stuff up now, aren't they? I hope you guys are doing okay. Whew. The good thing is, got my health thus far. Thus far is all good. The Lord is looking out for his boy down here, that's what I say. <laughs> Check in with us, Coffee Conversations with Greg J is on. Thank you guys so much. Man, I just want to say personally, you know, thank you to everybody that's been supporting us here and watching us and looking forward to our our telecast here, our stream, as we just explore cultural conversations from, you know, across the world. We uh, originate down here in Long Beach, California, but we are global in our perspectives, and you know we've had people from all over the diaspora. Today, you know, look, I'm watching the the impeachment trials up there in Washington, D.C., and, you know, watching the videos that the uh, House managers are are presenting before the the, uh, Senate there of the folks, you know, storming the the Capitol building. You know, a couple of weeks ago we had, uh, we found a video that my brother sent to me. We played that thing for about 45 minutes and just watched it all together on here so you could really see. I guess the guy had like a GoPro on, right? He was participating in the storming of the Capitol and it really gave you a strong perspective of what they were up to. And then these videos that they're showing even now uh, during the impeachment trial, uh, you know, is, is, is just profound, man, what, what really is going on in this country. And one of the things that stuck out to me is, you know, they were describing how one of the Capitol Police officers, a black man, was literally in tears and said that he had been called, you know, nigga about 15 times that day and poked and prodded and hit with sticks and everything. And he was like, man, is this America? And I think that, you know, is very reflective of what we are looking at now as a nation, what we're dealing with as a country, as a community, you know, we've got a rude wake up call. So now, man, we, we looking to our institutions, looking to our activists, we're looking to our inside, to our own consciousness as a community and just really, really evaluating where we are in America, in this land. And I think that the black church has a role in that. And that's why today we're going to have our uh, conversation. I'm very, very excited about this one today. So on PBS, right, the uh, renowned scholar Henry Louis Gates is presenting. It's, it'll take place next week. It's a two-parter. Uh, it's four hours long in total. It's called The Black Church. Uh, this is our story. This is our song. And uh, as I began to, you know, receive notices about this special on PBS, I, um, you know, just started thinking about the church's role in our community thus far in America from the beginning, right? It's like an institution in the community, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, preacher, you know, James Lowry, preacher. I mean, you just, just know what the church's role has been in our struggle. And, you know, now in this day and time, I mean, hey, we got to evaluate and look to the future. And so uh, I said, man, you know, let me uh, call up uh, Elder Lawrence Blake and see, uh, you know, he's a youth pastor, generations of of uh, men of God, and uh, certainly uh, has seen, put his eyes a lot, just a profound brother. That's what I've been able to always observe. I said, let's just have a conversation about this and examine the black church. But before we bring Elder Lawrence on, let me just hit this button. I'll play you the trailer. It's a couple of minutes long of uh, Henry Louis Gates' presentation, okay? Here it is right here. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. 
Help your child learn at home with PBS Kids. Together, explore reading, math, and science, life lessons, and more right alongside your favorite characters on TV and anytime on the PBS Kids 24-7 channel. And we offer free resources to help with at-home learning. Visit pbskids.org for educational tips, lessons, and hands-on activities. Also, sign up to receive even more information by email. Discover lots of fun tools and ideas to keep your child engaged. Learn at home with PBS Kids. This is our story. Jesus today, oh God, we are rising. The black church was more than just a spiritual home. It was the epic center of black life. Out of it came our black businesses, our black educational institutions. The black church gave people a sense of value, belonging, and worthiness. I don't know how we could have survived as a people without it. To tell the story of American religion is to tell a political story. The black church helped us to withstand all the slings and arrows of segregation and the segregationists. We're willing to be beaten for democracy. Freedom! Who are the five great black preachers of all time? There's so many. Prathia Hall. Renita Weems. We serve a Jesus who came and turned over the tables. Jeremiah Wright. Gardner Taylor. Gardner Taylor. Howard Thurman. I left our oldest mosque, presiding Bishop Michael Curry. Love can be sacrificial. Did you think that you were going to get one amen out of those bricks? I learned how to see amens in their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to clap my hands. I'm going to clap my hands. I'm going to sing to the Lord. Some might argue that black church is the first black theater. The role of music in the black church is everything. How do you define gospel music? Oh, really simple. Gospel music is the sonic presentation that talks about the majesty of Jesus. Entertainment shouldn't be in the church. What do you think the preacher does? Yeah, you, the you, preacher, hand there, uh, yeah. hand there, uh, uh, what, that's entertainment. <laughs> The African-American church is 80 to 90 percent women, but the leadership is 80 to 90 percent male. There's an awful price to pay when you say that you're a same gender loving person. If you say you were born this way, then you're saying, God, you're a liar. We are a testament to the goodness and the grace of God. Everything in the world has tried to kill us and we're still here. Culture says you're the wrong race. The price says I made your race, and I ain't made no mistake. It was our bomb in Gilead, the place where our people made a way out of nowhere. It was that place from which our souls could look back and wonder how we got over. We call it the church. Yes. Okay. Well, what do you think about that? Wasn't that great? Let's see. Elder Lawrence Blake, what's your thoughts there, sir? How are you, How doing, you doing, Greg? Greg? Good morning. I'm, I'm glad, glad to be, to be here, here having, having this, cup this cup of coffee. coffee. Come on now. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing in the COVID uh, world here? You staying safe? Everybody good? Family good? Man, everybody's, everybody's good. good. And COVID, COVID really, really has... has just, just cause me, me to sit right, right in the middle, middle of mixed, mixed emotions. emotions. Mm -hmm. um, um, on, on one hand, hand there's, there's been, been so, so much death, death so, so much loss, loss uh, so, so much sickness. sickness. Uh, really, uh, really, just, just an uh, uh, all around, around confusion. confusion. And, and then on, on the other hand, just, just like you were saying, God's been good. 
Um, um, he's tempting me, and, 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 and I've had, had time, time to spend with my family, family that, that I don't, I don't usually, usually have. have. Am, Am I, I echoing? echoing? Yes, you are. I think you are. Let's see. Okay, okay let, let me... me. Let me see. We had that the other day, too. Let me see. Okay, how, how does this how does sound? It's about, oh, it's the, about same, the same, huh? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, all right, I know what I'm going to do. Let me just do one thing. I'm going to try this here. Okay, one okay. moment, please. All right. Let's try that. How's that sound? Can you okay, hear me? Okay, it sounds good to me. I switched to my internal microphone on the computer, so that might help to help also. Uh, yes, okay. All right. Sounds yeah. good to me now. It sounds good to me too. Hold on a second here. Let me just double check one thing before we proceed. Okay. All right, let's get it. All right, all right. All systems go. <laughs> <laughs> Take off. Yeah, so as I was saying, um, it's so much death on one hand, and then on the other hand, um, you know, with uh, uh, they say if you have existing conditions that is worse for you, well, I'm one that does have existing conditions, but God has been faithful in taking care of me, looking over me, and looking over my family. So God has been good during this time. I've learned a lot, um, learned a lot about myself. And then um, at the same token, uh, I'm still learning a lot about this society that we live in. It's, it's, it's strange, so much racism. And we've seen that um, show up time and time again. And then it's even shown up in a way that I don't think anybody expected it to show up just over the past four years. I mean, it's it's almost like we were kicked back about 50 years, it seems like. Well, you know, you're the youth pastor at West Angeles Church of God of Christ. And when we talk about the struggle, right, the struggle, like you say, it's, 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 it's like we got kicked back. So it, what it says to me is, you know, they just kind of never went away. They, they went into hiding, but now they're emboldened to come out. And we're this new generation, the, ne the generation now is uh, reminded that, hey, you know, there's still a lot of uh, uh, racial hatred out there. And when we look at struggles across the world, uh, my estimation has always been it wasn't until the youth got involved in the movement that you know successes began to happen you could see that in my day when i was a young 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 lad i'm still kind of young but by <laughs> young, <laughs> you know my day you know it wasn't it was the youth department when the youth department came out and followed dr king it was you know this is when the movement began to take off even if you look over into south africa when the youth took to the streets uh, over their curriculum uh, that they were forced to learn in schools, that's when the movement began to get legs and change began to happen. Yes. I did go out on May 31st last year out into the streets here in Long Beach because I just wanted to hear it and experience it and feel it. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm looking around and saying, man, these are my nieces and nephews and sons and daughters out here, you know, and this is, you know, the, the, the deal. And, and it's not until the youth stand up and say, so the youth in the church, what are they saying to you, Elder Blake, and, and how do you see them fitting into today's struggle? Well, number one, they definitely fit uh, because they have to. Um, their future, our future is riding on them. Um, their children's futures are riding on them. And uh, one thing I will say, we definitely have to keep an eye on this as we have. Um, but I've often looked at some of our methods and how we do what we do. Uh, Greg, I'm, I'm going to be uh, myself. Come on, and, man. you know, honestly, um, I will never, ever say that what we've done in the past as black people has not worked. Um, but what I will say is, and this is just me. 
Uh, what I will say is the thing that has made you sick is not going to make you well. Um, meaning the doors we're knocking on, I don't know if they're ever going to turn around and give us anything. The oppressor is not going to really release you, and that's in the hands of God. Um, number one, I believe the Bible and the Bible says in the last days, uh, men will be lovers of themselves. Um, you know, I, I don't know in my heart if racism will ever disappear. Uh, but then when you look at the church's mission, you have to equate it to the mission of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sent to a people that didn't want his message. They didn't want to receive it. But at the same token, Jesus wholeheartedly went out and did what he was supposed to do. Um, we owe it to those who are coming behind us the same way we owe it to those who went before us to keep on going. So many people have sacrificed everything just so you and I can sit here even on, on this computer platform and have this conversation. Right. Uh, life has been lost. So much has been lost. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, the youth of today would spit on everything that those before us have done if they don't pick up this mantle and run into the future. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that is extremely necessary is we still need mentoring in the lives of our young people, which is key um, to the future. We have so many distractions in this day that young people are leaning to. Social media is creating more self-proclaimed uh, prophets uh, than at any time in history. I mean, everybody's preaching, everybody got a word, everybody's a doctor um, on social media and the information they're giving is not really proven, is not tested. So we have so many sources of information that sound good. And if they line up with the way we feel on any particular day, that's which way we run. So the church has a lot to do um, in the future, in the life of youths. And if we as black people, is we as a family do not stop fighting inside of the house, I mean, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to us outside of the house. So I, I might have said too much, but I'm going uh, uh, to hey. sip my coffee and let you jump in. <laughs> you know, yeah, because we could be our own worst enemies. You know, I mean, that's the thing is like, man, we got to fight the outside. But then sometimes you got to fight worse with our own. And so yeah. we've got to yeah. get that back. I heard uh, I heard a, a minister say one time that envy is the cancer that would kill the black community. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, that's a, that's the whole thing. You got to fight them and, you know, jealous of each other. And, oh, man, it's just really, really, really crazy. So you know, let me just kind of, I want to circle back to that point, but let's, let's okay. kind of talk about something right now. So, you know, this is the question that I have been wrestling with the whole of 2020, ever since things began to explode. And, um, you know, we went through the election season and I'm hearing the evangelical Christians, evangelical yeah. Christian, evangelical Christians. And I'm like, you know, OK, I'm going to ask you, like I, I asked uh, Carlton Pearson the other day and a few other men of God I've had come through here to sip coffee with me. <laughs> All right. So I'm sitting there in West Angeles Church. OK. And Bishop Blake has the guest preacher who's the white man. And I'm saying, is he talking about the same Jesus? <laughs> wow. What do, you, what do you think? <laughs> well, um, it goes back to the word. <laughs> and if what someone says does not line up with what God says, the way he meant it when he said it, um, you, you, you got to be careful listening to who you listen to. Um, people have different thoughts of Jesus. And we as human, the Bible says we love to be in the dark. 
Uh, there are certain people that don't want to be told certain things because the Bible says we love the darkness. Um, but I think historically people have just kind of created their own Jesus. Now, you know that this is a form of idolatry. So a lot of people who believe they're preaching Jesus and running to Jesus really are not. Um, Bible said many will come to me in that last day saying, Lord, Lord. And I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Um, if, if I claim to know you and all I know is your name and don't know anything about you, but I assume and speculate and go tell people, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Greg, Greg used to live in uh, Maine and and I don't know anything about what I'm talking about mm -hmm. um, you know I'm at a disadvantage and everybody I talk to about you is at a disadvantage and also you're at a disadvantage mm -hmm. so the key is wisdom both from the preacher or the speaker and then wisdom from the listeners to really contemplate and think about what the preachers are talking about um, even the very elect is, is in Satan's aim to be manipulated. Mm -hmm. So we owe it to ourselves as believers and Christ followers to basically see what he said first and through his Holy Spirit, may his spirit guide us in that thinking as we test what we hear. Okay, so, you know, I, I've read, there was an article that uh, came out in December, and this is going on in the Southern Baptist uh, denomination, the largest evangelical, right. you know, right. organization. <laughs> and uh, they basically said that the whole thing of critical race theory, that is to say, you know, we've been going to these, I don't know if the audience, you know, that you have these seminars now where people are, they're talking about conscious and unconscious bias companies and corporations are, right. are beginning to, you know, have these seminars so that we can recognize, you know, the, the racial biases that happen in the workplace, on the street, out there, you know, people are trying to heal and do, you know, correct this thing called racism, systemic racism. And so the Southern Baptists came out in their doctrine and said, okay, we should not have that. They were following along with mm -hmm. President Trump yeah. when former President Trump said, uh, that, you know, he wanted to eliminate these types of seminars from government offices and everything like that. And, um, you know, the black preachers that are in the Southern Baptist denomination are in an uproar now. They're saying, OK, well, on one hand, you all are saying no racism. But at the, on the other hand, you're supporting white supremacy. And this is what I'm what I'm talking about. It's like, OK, do do our do the evangelicals re is it that they don't realize that they are supporting white supremacy or are they still, as James Cone said, is it is, you know, the lynching tree and the cross, you know, this is the, this is the symbol of oppression and 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 subjugation of human beings. Um, are, what are my evangelical Christian people talking about? What is their problem? Well, I think um, people have learned not to care um about black people um I, I i can't go into the mind of the evangelicals um i i've learned to to stay home look after home take care of myself because ain't nobody else gonna do it That's right. um you know they're actually on the fence and what i will say about us uh, we, we're looking for help. Um, we're, we're looking for people to agree with the fact that, Hey, we need to be treated just like everybody else, mm -hmm. but we're living in a world where most people think if you get what you want, I'm not going to get what I want. So, like I said, uh, men will be lovers of themselves. I think everyone loves themselves so much. Um, they're not able to really even reach out and even understand somebody else's pain or their struggle. Um, I, I recently saw a video of a white gentleman who was basically upset because 
and these are his words. Um, you know, we we want to fight for something. We don't have anything to fight for. And, you, you know, I mean, everyone is concerned about themselves. And those who are less fortunate just stay less fortunate because of that thought. We we just want an equal shot. <laughs> you know, we want the equal chance that everyone else has. But at the same token, in looking at ourselves, will we be satisfied with that or would we even try to run further with it? So I think there's a little bit of lack of concern but then at the same time, there's fear because everyone feels that if I give you this, it's, it's, it's subtracting something from what I have or it will take something from me in the future. Um, so it's, it's really an aspect of the love of God being really the only thing that's going to change people's hearts because I, I just don't see how society is going to change the hearts of men at this point mm -hmm. with, with, with the big, my biggest question <laughs> for the past five years is in our political world, how can certain things happen? <laughs> right, right, right. You know? And so everyone has been looking at the candidate as if the candidate was the problem, but America elected the candidate. So I have to ask, is the candidate the problem or is our state of mind in America the problem? And one has everything to do with the other, sure. but I'm still standing there on that November day in unbelief of how did this happen? Right, right. <laughs> you know, so it's the, the past four years has been a blur because I've been standing there on election day years ago wondering now how... Uh, yeah, how did uh, this happen? How did this happen? Man. So I'm still there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so now, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned something that's very interesting. Social media has brought forth uh, so many, you know, everybody got a word to say, you know, and certainly <laughs> I think that church has uh, received its share of criticism over the last, you know, let's say 10 years as yes. uh, the explosion of the, the mega church and the, you know, everybody on TV. And it's just like, it's become like in that piece we just saw uh, from PBS, you know, and yeah. entertainment, you know what I mean? And so now I think the church has a, a they're at an inflection point right now. I think, uh, you know, it's it's past the entertainment. How do you get back? How does the church, what does the church need to do to get back to that organic taking care of the community where, you know, how do we get beyond <clears throat> the ceremony of church, the show business of church? Well, I think more churches really need to understand their goal and their mission. Um, Jesus spent time healing the sick. He he spent time seeing to the needs of who he could. Um, he didn't take care of everyone's physical and medical needs when he was here, but those who he could reach and those who he was in contact with, he did. I believe the church should provide every opportunity um, that they can for those in their community. Um, if the church can offer jobs, I believe they should offer jobs like at West Angeles. Uh, one of the main things that, uh, I know we do is we seek to, to educate, um, those in the community. We have home buying seminars. We have mentorship programs. We have, uh, other programs that show people where the money is, meaning how do you get grants, grant writing and, there are so many different things that we as a church do, but many churches are not able uh, to provide these opportunities because of um, their position, financial positions, um, the support that they get from their members, because members also have to learn that they are the church. Um, at West Angeles, we have a lot of members who ask, well, what what is the church going to do about this? And what is the church going to do about that? And I'm sitting there saying, well, you are the church. So 
what are we going to do? Every church member has a responsibility as a believer and a church member to go back to their community, take what they learned at church and apply it as an individual in their neighborhood. I don't know if that's happening on a wide scale. Something in the back of my mind says, I don't think so. Right. Um, but if the church would stop looking at itself saying, well, what can, what are y'all going to do? You, you know, and like me personally, personally, a few years ago, um, I decided to take $30. I took $30 to a 99 cent store. I bought some bread, I bought sandwich meat, bought a whole lot of stuff and ended up uh, creating some homeless packages. Um, this was after trying to get a, a lot of different things started in a group, I'll say. You, you know, sometimes groups don't work. And if you really have the passion to do something, if you really think something should be done as a black person, you owe it individually to the community to, to pick up the baton and do something. Martin Luther King didn't do what he did because he had a whole group of people supporting him. He did what he did because he felt it that strongly in his heart. And if the people who claim to follow Jesus do not understand that I individually have a mess, uh, um, uh, uh, um, a purpose and, and a, a message to take to society, um, they're not going to get it. Uh, Jesus calls individuals to be the church. And if the individual does not act like the church, the church won't look like the church. So, um, but like I said, I believe churches should provide every opportunity they can. If there are those that are sick and hungry, we're supposed to feed them. We're supposed to clothe the poor. And when churches start thinking about um, how big they want to be because they want to be the biggest church and they lose focus and they start giving to themselves instead of giving to the community. But if you understand what God's church really is supposed to be, God's church is the community, it's the people. It's made up of people all throughout the community who have decided to um, live their life according to uh, the commandments of God. And oh, wherever the, oh, excuse me, you no, go. go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say wherever those people are, they're considered to be God's church. Hmm. All right, so now, you know, there's a lot of the community who are turned off from the church because, yep. you know, they get... They encounter, you know, folks who go to church and, you know, everybody high minded and judgmental and just really, you know, lacking of compassion. Um, you know, how do you, those that are in the church, how do they humble themselves so that they can do this interaction one on one? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a notion to feed, you know, somebody on the, to see on the street, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and you, you know, people have that. Oh, you know, oh, hey, on the street, you know, it's it's really a, a a bad thing. So, how do we stimulate more compassion with the people? Well, I've been trying to figure that out for about six years. What? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> so, so it, it's funny that you say that because um, you know, and hopefully, I don't make anybody mad with this, <laughs> but. But when I went to that 99 cent store and took my $30, <laughs> I was in my feelings upset because, you know, we we have this big push to do something. We say, hey, we're going to go down to Skid Row. We're going to feed the poor. We're going to look out for the homeless. And, you know, you, you got 100 people raising their hands saying, yeah, but the morning you go downtown, three people show up. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so it's one, you lead by example. Mm -hmm. And number two, uh, Bishop Blake taught me this. Never worry about who's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, you worry about who is there and you worry about who you're taking the message to, who you're catering to, mm -hmm. because many of the people that you take the message to and God blesses them through you. Those people who are 
affected most by the message will be the ones that most likely pick up the message. Um, if if you, you can't expect people who don't feel that they need to be doing anything to do anything, you, you know, um, I've learned that if you, um, and, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to jump on, I don't want to step on no toes, but then again, <laughs> Ah, we're you, just you, chopping it up here, you know. We, we, we're talking here. It's all good. We can talk. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, if, if, if people do not understand the importance and the purpose of the message of God, um, they won't get it. You, you, you got to understand that the, the main priority of the church is to bring salvation to the people, number one. In bringing that salvation, which is done in a certain way, the way God says it, a lot of things are comprised in that. Some people try to leave things out, and service is one of those things. If you preach a message, and, well, I don't do this, but I've heard messages preached where preachers will say, when you get home, it's going to be a check in your mailbox. Mm -hmm. The whole church is up. Everybody's yeah, running yeah, around. Yeah. But if they say, hey, uh, church, we got work to do, you might have a few. So the truth is, as human people, some people don't want to work. Um, some people are not down for every cause. But then there are those that are. If you find the ones that are down for the cause, like Jesus handpicked the disciples. Mm -hmm. He walked past people. He saw Matthew sitting at his tax desk, say, hey, Matthew, get away from that desk. Come and follow me. He saw Peter fishing. Hey, come and follow me. But how many people did he walk past? You know, how many how many people did he even look at and anticipate that? No, they're not going to get it. They're not going to pick up the message and run with it. So only certain people are going to pick up really the, the entire gospel message in entirety. Only certain people are going to pick that up. And I believe we have to be keen enough in the Holy Spirit to understand who those people are. And if they don't show up, we have to be willing to walk as strongly as Jesus did and do it ourselves. That's what so many, so many of my mentors did that. And when I look at their lives, they had a certain period of loneliness, a certain period of work. And then all of a sudden people were behind them. So I believe if people see you gaining momentum and picking up speed, they'll join in and they'll be, it, it, it'll be contagious. And um, um, I just believe that. I don't believe we should give up because no one else is doing anything. I believe we should keep on pushing and keep on fighting because the, the fact of just the fight brings people hope. And I think hope is what's needed most, and that's been what's needed, hope. Um, as long as we have hope, honestly, as long as we have hope in the situation, the situation really doesn't even have to change, but our hope will give us strength to stand, and the fact that we stand is the victory, I believe. I, you know, that's just uh, how I feel, Greg. Sure, absolutely. Now, all right, so <clears throat> church and social justice, let's talk about this for a minute. And uh, one aspect of social justice I'd like to tackle, uh, okay, so it's easy for, you know, the people of the church to go out, if they're so inclined, to yeah. take the $30 <laughs> and get some sandwiches and whatnot to, to help yeah. the homeless. Okay, that's, uh, that's the easy part. But what about the more difficult task in our community? So as an example, you know, here in Long Beach and actually across Southern California, you know, you're seeing a rise in, in violence, right? Shooting violence yes. and, and uh, gang violence and all of that. And I just believe that there are, you know, I've just seen in my experience, I have seen, you know, men of the men and women of the pulpit come out onto these here streets and, and broker, you know, peace among the, mm -hmm. the gang sets out there, you know, and you know, now that we see uh, such an increase in, in, in violence and street politics at play, I, mean, I know the folks at yeah. City Hall are trying to figure it all out, but how can the, what's the church's role? How can they be effective on a street level of creating peace 
among gang culture? Well, like I, I mentioned, mentoring um, on one aspect, mentoring is important at a young age because through that mentorship, you're able to prevent certain people from going into um, into that life. type of behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when I look at myself, um, I had two God fearing parents, which, you know, mm -hmm. um, they did everything they could to keep me out of certain life. Um, I still went into it and, and I had to learn that everything they said was the truth, mm -hmm. but I didn't accept it from them. So we're, we're, you know, we're a hard headed people. Mm -hmm. um on one side of it so the early teaching of it is good because one day i came to myself and i said you know what uh this life is not for me mm -hmm. my parents told me that i didn't listen but i had i had to go back to my parents and apologize and say everything y'all told me was the truth um if me people <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Right. So if people are left to their own idle minds, their own thought, everybody needs a shepherd. And one thing that I notice about our young people today is it's a people that feel like they really don't need a shepherd. Hey, I mean, God speaks to me the same. One thing I hear in Bible study is God speaks to me the same way he speaks to you. And that might be true, but why is he telling you stuff different <laughs> than stuff that's in the Bible? <laughs> so, you, you know, um, there is a. Um, yeah, look at Janine. A, a Janine Blake said, because he met me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we leave that right there because she, she, she did help me out. She did. She did help me out. <laughs> Good stuff. But, hey, Janine. <laughs> but uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, what I definitely um, believe the church should do everything um, that it can to provide every opportunity uh, for equality within reason that it can. Um, it, like I said, if, if they can provide jobs, provide jobs, if they can go out into the community and just be sometimes stuff don't happen just because there's a respectable figure in that vicinity. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not saying that's going to stop everything, but sure. you see the Jehovah's witnesses, how they were out on the streets. And what if every spiritual institution just took it to the streets, talked to everybody they could. One of the things that causes people to do what they do is they're broken. And they stay broken because they feel that nobody cares. Nobody looks in on their situation. It doesn't matter what I do. No one's going to help me. So I just got to go do this. But what if everyone knew that, hey, there is a group of people that's concerned about you? Um, I would say we're not going to judge you. Right. But I understand the church is probably one of the most judgmental places on earth. Yeah. Um, so... You know, when when people come to church, I don't think the key is teaching people not to be judgmental. I think the key is making people understand that wherever you go, you're going to be judged. If you go to Burger King, you're going to get judged wherever you go. You're going to get judged. And the church is full of people who understand their brokenness and they're trying to be better uh, than they really are. So one of the ways people naturally do that is I look at your shortcomings and that makes me feel better about myself. So that's one of the things that people need to understand. You're going to be judged whatever you do for the good you do, for the bad you do, and your friends judge you. So if people could understand that uh, people in church are sick, the, ch the, the, the church is full of sinners. And I think when people come to church, they're expecting to see heaven on earth. But we're at church. So from the pastor all the way on down, we're all trying to make it to heaven. And people need to understand that. Now, when I go in this hospital, 
and I get in this waiting room, everybody in there is waiting for the doctor because they sick. Mm -hmm. So some of them might be acting funny. Some of them might be hollering or whatever. But I think we need to tell people that when I invite people to church, I tell them what they come in to see. I tell them that, well, you might you don't just open up to everybody just because they had church, because just because they're there, that doesn't mean that they got your best interests at hand. So um, one thing the church does need to open up, um, but at the same token, I think they need to open up outside of the walls of the church. And it's not about when the people come uh, to the church, what can we do? But when we take the church out to them, we need to teach them what the real message of the church is. And it's not so much about doing stuff how we do on Sunday, dressing how we dress, but the main message of the church is really getting Jesus in your heart. And if we could teach people that the relationship is truly between them and Jesus, and we at the church are just who you fellowship with, we're just here to encourage you and keep you strong. Um, if we could teach people that message, I think their expectation will be different when they come to church and they'll be looking more to Jesus than they look to the people um, at the church. Hopefully I spoke uh, to your question. No, no. Yeah, yeah. It's a little good. So so no, let me ask you this. All right. So that's good. Prevention uh, and, uh, you know, just bringing people you know, into the church, church needing to go outside of the walls. Got it. All right. So now here we are in a in a in a in a day and time where so many black folks have been locked up in the penitentiary. Now they're coming home, uh, and that might be contributing to you know the stress and strife and violence we're seeing on the street. How can the church help the brothers and sisters who've been locked up, <clears throat> coming out? They got nowhere to turn no type of hope everybody's turning them away because they got a record mm. now the only place i can think about going to is that church down there on the corner how can the church be effective in helping the brothers and sisters who come home from from the system and and continue that rehabilitation you know well uh well you say continue to rehabilitate i don't know if the rehabilitation really ever started <laughs> but uh <laughs> right, right, right but um one thing that they can do is consider programs, um, create ways for felons to work. Um, we have a few programs. I know that uh, we have helped a few felons, uh, but in society, um, it's, it's hard for them to get ahead. And I think if the church creates ways of rehabilitation, like you said, putting life back together, putting credit back together, you know, uh, money management teachings and just a lot of things that are geared directly for people that society is not going to give a chance. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we can help people rebuild their lives. I believe that churches have the money to really create communities for the homeless, for ex-convicts, who come out, you create a little community, put a gate around it, and they learn how to survive in that smaller community. And once they spend nine, 10 months there, a year or whatever, learning, working with someone right there on those premises that maybe they can graduate outside of that gate. It's not another prison, but the gate is there to keep people out, <laughs> not to keep people in. Yeah. Um, the more people that get involved with a plan, the more like uh, the past plans it's going to look. Um, one key is, like I said, the thing that made you sick is not going to make you well. I don't think we can ask the government, how can we help uh, ex-prisoners put their lives back together? Because, the you know, and I don't get mad, government, but... <laughs> I mean, they, you know, they, they, they caused all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they caused it. So um, it's not penicillin where they give you some, some yeah. of what made you sick and it makes you well, but this is totally different. Uh -huh. um, the, 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 the church relies on Jesus for everything. 
we we pray, we we do a lot, but then faith without works is dead. I believe that our creativity, um, our push at this point in time, church innovation is essential. Um, so we need to innovate, and I think we need to really, really, really um, create direct programs for uh, direct people. The blanket programs, they work a little bit, but I think people need their direct needs focused on. Focused, sure. And um, I believe the church focus, uh, the church motivation and allocation of their resources, how they've been doing things um, needs to change. Instead of looking at it from the top down, look at it out of the view of someone who um, is less fortunate, someone way down at the, at the bottom of the barrel, how do they look at it? What would really help them? Um, it's easy to give somebody $20 when you see them in need. But if you remember Peter walking into to the, the, uh, the, the past, the gate called beautiful into that temple, there was a man that said, Hey, 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 g- g- give me some money. Give me some silver. Give me some gold. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I give to you. And it boils down to, do we want to give people handouts or do we want to give them a hand up, which will cause them to be able to pull somebody else up? So we've been given handouts for so long. We give people um, band-aids instead of a cast. And I think in the church, we need to really focus on working with people, bringing them to the point where they're ready to go uh, without their training wheels. And, and that's one of the, the main reasons. That's what, that's what I'm going to be working on for the future. I'll just say it like that. That's, that's right. Um, that's right. You, you know, you know was- that. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> you talked about, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I will co-sign something. You talked about credit, right? I just took the uh, little credit seminar at the West Angeles CDC. And All was, right. Uh, was, I participated in that, just trying to step in and change some things, you know, COVID yeah, I got yeah. us all self reflecting Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. Co- like, COVID yeah. will make you borrow money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just try to just try to check it out. So that's a that's a good. So you you know you, you you're doing the work. That's really a beautiful thing. Now, yes, sir. okay. So as we uh, you know kind of talk about this special that uh, we saw the trailer for at the beginning happening uh, next week on PBS, and you know, by the way, yes, audience, sir. if you all. Uh, need to get your uh, Black History Month on, just tune into PBS because uh, they have been back to back to back. Man, they were talking about uh, the Freedom Riders and just so much rich history. And I'm really glad to see this piece by Henry Louis Gates uh, talking about the history of the church and really stimulating, uh, you know, thought of, okay, what is the role of the church of the Black church in our in our struggle now? Because this thing is, it's real right now. And uh, not only here in America, but global. And so yeah. let's talk about this. You know, we're dedicated over here at uh, Dream Creator Studio, BeachCityRadio.com, and uh, Hannibal Media Group. We're dedicated to building bridges of music, arts, and culture with Africa and African Americans. And I, I'm going to tell you, your dad is the one that got me on this path to Africa. Uh, he was, I'll tell you the story. We were, uh, he came, I was on the radio on front page on KJLH, 4.30 in the morning, and we were just chopping it up just like now before we go out the air. And he just looked at me and says, you know, Brother Johnson, we need to be global. We need to be global. You know, you need to see about yeah. your brothers and sisters in Africa. And I was just sitting there going, hmm. This is very, very interesting. And this that conversation has gotten me on this road. I've been back and forth to Africa many times. If you tune in to Coffee Conversations with Greg J, you see we regularly feature somebody from live from the continent and there. Yes. What is the what do you say about the global aspect, the church's role in the diaspora? <clears throat> uh, what is our role there? Globally, um <clears throat> I would say the role almost depends on the church's capability. Mm -hmm. Um, Bishop Blake uh, was touched. He, he, he went to, I believe it was a seminar in Boston and he was made aware of everything 
that was happening in Africa, like you said, and he picked up that mano and decided to go. Um, you, in turn, had a conversation with him and uh, his feeling and the feeling that was given to him was a contagious feeling. Um, like I said, the church's role in the world is the same as it is in the community. Uh, within reason, whatever you can provide for the betterment of life, I believe that's what you should do. Uh, Bishop Blake had the ability as a pastor. West Angeles had the ability as a church to go to Africa. Um, many churches have abilities. I know uh, Bishop Ron Gibson, he's doing a lot of work in the Dominican Republic. So God placed that on his heart. It's a lot of people whose hearts have been tugged on. And I believe the leadership of the church always uh, determines the direction of the church by God. But um, the members also have to understand that they are the church and they also have to understand that they also have a responsibility. But if you can, if I can feed the poor in Mexico, um, that's what I'm called to do. If, if I can teach uh, and mentor young men in Africa, that's what I'm called to do. If God places something on your heart, that might be your calling. And you don't have to worry about ability as much or focus on it as much because God will make a way. Um, but as far as uh, the relationship with us in Africa, uh, I heard you mention I'm kind of turning a little bit right here. <laughs> um, I will say if Africa is um, not protected, I don't think the world will be okay. Um, many of our problems, you know, uh, started because of the problems in Africa. And I don't believe our American issues will be solved until certain problems in Africa are solved. Um, it's not a, just about, uh, well, Afro-Americans have it good because what an Afro-American. I mean, the, all of the people need it good, which um, is a uphill battle. And if we can't cater to ourselves, nobody else will. So um, our mission as being believers, as being Christ followers, is first bringing salvation. We're concerned about a person's everlasting soul first, but it's hard to preach to someone when they're hungry. So uh, we also have the mission of looking out uh, for people uh, who are in need. We have the mission of looking out for widows wherever they may be. God didn't say uh, take care of the poor and take care of the widows just on your block, but he said, go ye into all of the world, which means not just take the gospel, but take your ability, take those things that I have gifted you with, take all of you, all of what I've made you to the world, to be a light to the world, to, to bless them uh, somehow financially, uh, bless them mentally, educationally, um, you, you know, so we have a big mission and it can't be summed up in just a couple of words. Uh, like some would say, well, we just supposed to do the gospel. No, sharing the gospel is more than just sharing the gospel. Um, so it's an uphill fight that we have. Uh, it's an uphill battle, but with God's help, uh, we can do it. And we don't need to just stay in our churches on Sunday uh, because that's defeating the purpose of coming to church. If you get salvation and you just open that bottle of salvation on Sunday and then you leave church and say, oh, church was good. The, the church don't have any feet, <laughs> you know. But if you understand that God called you to salvation to take salvation to other people in the form of witnessing, in the form of encouragement, however you get that salvation to them is what we're called um to do 
All right. All right. Good stuff. You know, as we approach the end of our time here, I want to cover one last quick thing. I know I know you got beats over there. I, I, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, so, that's my little pastime. <laughs> yeah. 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 So so let's talk about the music for a minute there. We even saw in that trailer there they, they did focus on gospel music and you know, I mean, being a radio person, certainly I'm a big music head and I yes, have sir. seen, you know, gospel evolve. And so sometimes I'm wondering, you know, so right now by my critique of gospel music is that we um, are trying so hard to be like the CCM format when for those of that you don't know that, OK, so we have gospel music. And then they have what's called contemporary Christian music. These are the designations that the industry right. has applied to the music. So contemporary Christian means, you know, the white gospel. Okay, so let's, let's, let's keep it real. So is our we've kind of gotten away from the essence of gospel music, you know, the feel of it, because it sounds like now the writers are trying to mimic what they hear in the CCM. I guess they're trying to get that crossover appeal, if you will. Yeah. What do you do you agree with that? And what do you think? What's where are we going in gospel music? Wow. That's a good one, right? <laughs> um it's um I will say their gospel music does still exist. <laughs> I will say that uh much of what we hear um can be uh related to much of what we hear from preachers mm -hmm. uh every preacher that we hear or every sermon that we hear is not always a gospel message mm -hmm. um some of it is encouraging but it doesn't say jesus mm -hmm. uh what makes something gospel is that it leads you to the cross um, it leads you to scripture. It leads you to where God wants you to be. It speaks to your spirit more so than your flesh. Mm -hmm. And what we see nowadays, I think, is more music that may speak to the flesh because it comes from a fleshly standpoint. Uh, it comes from uh, maybe like you mentioned, crossover. Maybe when I sit down to write this song, I'm thinking about, well, how can I go platinum? Right. Uh, because nobody that makes music wants to make music just to be heard by two or three people. You want the masses to hear it, which means you want to get paid. Right. So uh, our intent, and I will say our intent as music writers determines what our music sounds like, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's as safe as I'll put it. I ain't saying no names. I'm not, <laughs> that's right, that's <laughs> you, you know, we, we got a lot riding on this. Place. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Well, you know, there it is. Uh, I, 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 you know, gotta, gotta have a, a good, good observation and critique of the music. That's for sure. I, I mean, um, and, and without saying names, you're absolutely right. It's, it's just very, a very interesting uh, perspective. I mean, let me ask you this question. I, 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 I'm wondering, okay, so, <laughs> so in those high praise moments of the gospel music, do you hear the musicians when they pick up riffs from like part of a funkadelic or <laughs> you, you know what, Greg? <laughs> My my head might nod a little while, and then I was like, "Hey, that's familiar." <laughs> so, so right? I, I I music like they say music is universal. Universal. <laughs> and and sometimes you know uh, you know people used to ask me, "Well, how come how come you you don't play? Uh, how come you don't play at church?" And Greg, when I started playing. Um, the keyboard, you know, I was listening. It was back back in the day. I was listening to Michael Jackson, you know, cameo stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So when I, you know, when I sit down to play something, you know, and I, I'm used to playing what I used to play. So. Sure, that's right. That's and right. and I think musicians are the same way, and some of them may get carried away 
in, in the music. I'm, I'm not saying I, I ain't saying the musicians at West Angeles do this, but but yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who said that? <laughs> but but um, like like I say, music is universal, and I I do say uh, people should be very careful with what form of music they bring into praise, because sometimes I'll be on a high note of praise, but there are certain tunes if I hear them, I'm coming right out of that praise because I know where it came from and. In my mind, is I know the message of that song. So sometimes the message of what they play is able to overshadow what's really going on. Um, so I'll leave that one right there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, you know what? To me, it, it shows the essence of black music, right? And, and um, you know, yeah, we know that, you know, secular music is, you talk to all the big stars, they, I was in flow, I played in church. I mean, that's where, yeah. that's where yeah. it started. It is what it is, right? Yeah. Uh, we were at a, um, a talk given by Bootsy Collins, right? Okay. Over at the Miracle Theater in Inglewood. And um, super producer Rhonda Love asked this question and she got up there and she asked him, uh, you know, hey, what were your influences? And he said two. There was one, he was influenced by Afrobeat over in Africa. But the okay. number one influence he had, it was like, oh no, the church. Mm-hmm. So we're talking mm-hmm. Bootsy Collins, the, the on the one, you know, he's yeah. sharing with you, hey, uh-uh, it was the church that made my, that's where I got my chops. That's where, you know, mm-hmm. where the essence mm-hmm. of it is. And that's why I think it's just really funny sometimes that when you're in church and this whole church is going crazy, the, the music is jamming, jamming, then you hear those licks. Uh, we were talking to uh, a friend of ours, of the professor, Dr. Daniel Walker, and who has written many documentaries about the evolution of gospel music, right? Yeah. And so I asked him the same question. I said, do you hear like, do you hear the licks in there? We just started cracking up because you, you do hear it. <laughs> and so it is the relation of the rhythm. It's the one, it's the mm-hmm. essence of us, you know, that yeah. comes and it comes out of the church into our culture. Yeah. 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 Elder Lawrence Blake, yeah. man, thank you for coming through this morning. Oh, thanks for, for having me, with Greg. Brother. Yes, Baby, sir. You know, I, I knew we were going to have this cup of coffee soon, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, you got an open door. Come back anytime. Let's Definitely. chop it up. And, Definitely. And, and, uh, man, when, when, when we can travel, uh, I'm going to have to go to Africa with you. Come on now. Let's get it. Hey, we, we'll do that. Drink, drink some coffee out there. Yes, sir. Oh, man. You know, really, really, really delicious coffee. And, uh, oh, yeah. Introduce you to my friends over there and everything. You just have oh, a yeah, great definitely. time. Oh, yeah, definitely. That would be awesome. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Greg. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, family. Look, thank you for listening to Coffee Conversations with Greg J. We are on demand. Beach City Radio, BeachCityRadio.com, all over Facebook. You know how to get us. Just go on, tell your friends, share, like, all of that. Listen, next week, Tuesday, uh, we have, uh, let's see, yes, that'll be Dr. Anthony Samad from uh, the oh, Mervyn yeah. Diamond Lee. Uh, African American Economic and Justice Institute. I think I'm saying that right. Over there, Cal State Dominguez Hills. They have got a, uh, an event coming up, They're working towards racial concili- reconciliation. Uh, this one is called For Whites Only. Wow. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Very profound stuff there. Then after that, who else we got coming up? Up. Oh, you know what? We want you to be informed. Listen, just as a sidebar, I didn't really talk about this much this morning, but. You know, this COVID thing is really serious, right? These vaccinations are going around. I know we are, some of us are apprehensive. I know I am. And uh, I just want to get the information and I want to use my platforms to get the information out to the people so that each and every one of you can uh, make the correct decisions. So we got Dr. Anissa Davis. She is the health officer uh, in the city of Long Beach coming on to chat with us about vaccinations, about you know, what the city of Long Beach is doing to help uh, facilitate that. Hopefully we'll be joined uh, by the California State uh, Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris on that one, as well as someone from the Martin Luther King Hospital. So, uh, you know, we're just trying to get the the best of the best on here to sip coffee with us and talk about and give you the right information. All of them are African-American, so they're speaking to us. You know what I'm saying? And so we want that information so we can make the proper decisions and take care of our health. 
All that said, everybody make it a great day and always remember love one another. Yeah. Love one another. Love one another. Peace and blessings. <laughs>